Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Engineering Student Experience Podcast. I'm Paul Nissenson from the Mechanical Engineering Department at Cal Poly Pomona. Think about how often you use electricity on a daily basis. How often do you need to use lights, refrigerators, an air conditioning system, a washing machine, a blender, a coffee machine, your cell phone charger, a computer, or the internet? Electricity allows me to make this podcast and for you to listen to this podcast. In much of the world, people are used to having electricity available on demand whenever we want it. And all of this is possible due to the efforts of countless engineers working at electric utilities who help transmit and distribute electricity from various sources like power plants to you, the consumer. Joining me today to talk about what it's like to work at an electric utility are Everett Aragon and Moeen Lack, both of whom work at Southern California Edison. SoCal Edison is a very large electric utility transmitting and distributing power throughout much of Southern and Eastern California and impacting the lives of millions of people each day. Everett Aragon is a senior engineering manager in the technology integration group and leads a team that creates and implements software tools that help visualize and modernize the grid. Everett obtained bachelor's degrees in computer engineering and electrical engineering from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's degree in electrical engineering from USC. Moeen is an engineering manager who focuses on distribution and deals with projects that impact the grid. Like when someone wants to install a new piece of equipment or when someone wants to create a new housing development or a new business. He works with both planners and customers to ensure there'll be enough power available for a given project. Moeen received a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering and has worked at utilities around the world. During our conversation, Everett and Moeen discussed the structure of SoCal Edison the different types of engineers who work for that organization, the importance of advanced degrees and getting professional licensure in their field, and the importance of communication, both with the public and internally with their colleagues at SoCal Edison. We also discussed the long-term challenges and opportunities facing electric utilities around the world, such as modernizing electrical grids that are becoming more and more complex every year. As Everett mentions in the interview, electrical grids were created when central power generation dominated. That is power generation provided by large coal or natural gas or nuclear power plants, which can provide power 24 hours a day. However, over the last couple decades, there's been a big push by governments and individuals to adopt more renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind, which provide power intermittently and may be widely dispersed over a region. As we increase our use of renewable energy sources going forward, utilities will need to constantly adapt to ensure the lights will always turn on when you flip up a light switch. It was a very interesting conversation, and I had a great time talking with Everett and Moeen. Anyone who might be interested in working for an electric utility can learn a lot from listening to their experiences. Now let's get to that interview. All right. Well, I am here with Moeen Lack and Everett Aragon. And uh, today we're going to be talking about what it's like to be an engineer at an electric utility. Uh, Both Moeen and Everett work for Southern California Edison, which is a pretty big electric utility out here in Southern California. First of all, thank you both for joining me today on on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, I actually, I first met Moeen, I think it was back in spring 2019, and he was a guest speaker at a uh, banquet that my department has between uh, or with our students and faculty. And, you know, he was talking about things like the future of the the electrical grid and some of the challenges. And I, I thought it was really interesting. He was a great speaker. It was also around that time that I started uh, just thinking about doing this podcast and started making baby steps to make it happen. And so I grabbed his business card, kind of filed it away because I knew that that someday this day would this day would come. So uh, again, thanks for taking time. 
before we uh, get into your experiences being an engineer in the elect in, in an electric utility, I think it'd be helpful for the listeners to give a little bit of background about yourself. So how did you or when did you become interested in engineering and sort of what was the path that you took uh, to get where you're at today? And maybe we can start with uh, Moeen. Thanks, Paul. Uh, first of all, appreciate for having this session. Uh, it's always great to give it back to the community that we used to be part of in the school and kind of discuss about our experience. So we are, uh, for Everett and myself, we always enjoy to have these sort of discussions. So as far as the um, my interest in engineering, so um, one part about myself is uh, many of my family members, they, they hold it in an engineering degree, especially in electrical engineering. And uh, I always remember when my uncle was holding an IEEE uh, in a magazine, I was like, what is this IEEE thing? So I was always like, uh, was wondering what is those three E, you know, electrical engineering, you know, thing means. And he's always, you know, going after those and I start reading those. So that's one. And the second part was about uh, me having a lot of interest in physics and mathematics. I always really interested in application of these two and how these two make our life easier on a day to day basis. So um, that was when I started kind of thinking through, like, based on the options that I had available, uh, what are the ones that are closest to, one, follow the applications of physics and, you know, mathematics. And I was always being all a hands-on person, really, you know, uh, been, you know, spending a lot of time building and creating things, um, you know. So that was a, adding all these things together. It really interested me to go to the engineering. And, I think it's always good to go in engineering school and see if you like it, you continue. If you don't like it, you always can, you know, change your path and go to different directions. Uh, so I did put that expectation for myself that I'm going to enter into this field. And if I like it, I continue. If I don't, certainly I'll follow what I um, love to do, um, you know, as my day to day. So uh, I happened to go to the engineering school and uh, really enjoyed it. And I continued all the way to to the PhD level, and I really give me a very good feeling that you know that was the right path. And now when I do it as a day-to-day -day practice, uh, there is no day that I go home and I say I did not like what I wanted to do. I always believe and feel like I am doing what I love to do. Everett, how did uh, you uh, get to the point you're at today? Very, very somewhat similar to to what Moeen had described. Um, but I, I think early on, what's interesting, at, at least from, from my background, um, uh, I wanted to be a firefighter <laughs> for, for some reason. Uh, and maybe that's just, you know, as, as kids, you know, you, you're exposed to kind of, you know, policeman, firefighter, uh, lawyer, doctor, you know, kind of things. And uh, it wasn't until maybe around middle school, um, I really uh, got good at, at, at doing mathematics, uh, sciences, um, and, you know, just the, the teachers, the, you know, the different faculty that was around at the time uh, brought that idea up. They said, hey, you know, you're really good at math. How about trying engineering, right? So, so that kind of sparked that. Uh, then in high school, um, a lot of the uh, physics classes started to come in and really deep dove into that. And then, um, you know, it wasn't till, till like around later in high school where I uh, started thinking about, you know, college and the career and where to go with it and had the mind of the, or had the, this topic around engineering in mind. And, but at, at my time or during my time of going up through education, uh, video games was a big thing. Right. And, um, uh, being able to develop video games was kind of in my head, and there was there wasn't really a major for that. I mean, today there there's a lot of, of that, uh, and the closest thing was engineering, and it was either computer or, or electrical engineering, and I chose both. So, <laughs> so I went into that field and and started getting to know more of what you can do with engineering, and really understanding the different industries and. Uh, that that's what kind of got me here now. And uh, as I started um, understanding more of the, the different industries, uh, power really came to mind. And um, really the, the, I guess, tying like the video games and software solutioning, developing 
uh, was an interesting one for, for coming into engineering within Edison, uh, was really tied to uh, the project I came in on was uh, both a hardware and software solution, which helps us plan the grid uh, that we know today. So that's how, that's how I got here. <laughs> for the listener, it'd be great if you could provide a sort of a brief overview of what Southern California Edison uh, does, you know, what kind of activities it's responsible for. And um, is it pretty typical, you know, compared to other electric utility companies, or is there something unique about Southern California Edison? Yeah. So uh, what is, what is unique uh, about SoCal Edison or is it, similar to, to other utilities. Uh, I would say uh, the uniqueness about SoCal Edison is that it's only an, an electrical uh, power company. Um, some of our neighbors uh, have other industries within, within their company, right? Like San Diego Gas and Electric, of course they have gas and our neighbor to the north also has uh, a gas uh, aspect to it. And then uh, also for folks that aren't, uh, I guess, familiar with uh, non-independent uh, or investor-owned utilities, uh, you got your your municipalities, right? That that do various things. They could, you know, provide you know uh, sanitation services, water services, electrical or uh, power uh, services. So, so in a nutshell, yeah, SoCal Edison is definitely uh, just a electrical company or power company. The the other uh, kind of uniqueness to us is. Uh, in a, in a lot of different uh, projects or even things that we're, we're looking into to further uh, mon- modernize the grid or reimagine the grid, essentially we're, we're investigating or at times at the forefront or spearheading a lot of those efforts. So being able to integrate uh, um, what we call distributed energy resources or renewable power um, and how do we best partner with those those new technologies? How do we create uh, uh, a, a larger market for our customers? Not only, hey, here's the utility, we provide electricity, but you know, is there a partnership with, with these other renewable type of uh, resources? And how, uh, within Southern California Edison, how, are, how is it divided into different divisions or sections? Before I get to that question, one part I wanted to add to the great answer that um, Everett provided, I think um, Edison overall, Southern California Edison, uh, like Everett mentioned, is not only the keeping the light on, but also doing a lot of uh, development and researches, um, you know, within the local resources that we have uh, to not only reimagine the grid, but also bring it to the actual level of, you know, in the field, right? So. Uh, Kind of, they call it a technology utility, if you will, and you compare with other utilities that, based on my experience, um, and you know, like Everett mentioned, we are only responsible for electricity, but some areas like Catalina Island, we also provide like gas and you know other you know, sources as well. But focus mostly is on on electrical. Um, and when I say electrical, I just wanted to be clear: it doesn't mean that everyone we have in, in the company is electrical engineer. We have, you know, a broad spectrum of engineers from different you know, um, you know, the, uh, background in our team. And we'll get to it if the question come around, we can, we can talk about it more. But as far as how we are, um, it has been divided. So, you know, in we have, you know, we have a generation, you know, we have some generations, some limited generations, right, um, in, in, our, in our company. We also have a transmission, uh, which is pretty much a really interaction with, you know, uh, Cal ISO and uh, some entities outside of the CE. Uh, we also have a sub transmission, which is a lower voltage uh, than transmission, and we, after that we have, uh, which is kind of a unique system. Our sub transmission is a unique system, and then from there we go to distribution, uh, which is all the distribution class voltages that goes, you know, to the uh, customers' houses, and we have a secondary system that goes to, you know, actual, you know, pass the meter and goes to the to the customer. So, so what is uh, this is pretty much how we divide it, and the way that uh, these areas has been divided is by voltage class, right? Obviously the higher voltage in generation and then the transmission and then comes down to the subtrans and comes one step another down to, to distribution. And then, you know, you'll find 110 volt at, you know, at your house 
uh, with 220 depends on what configuration you have. But so pretty much that's how we have divided. And our AR is also divided based on that, right? So I'm responsible for the for part of the distribution, right? Um, you know, my team is really focused on distribution. Others are, you know, in different areas. Uh, and within the distribution, also we uh, not only based on the the distribution angle, but but also based on the location, right? So we have sectors, we have districts, we have regions, uh, you know, which covers multiple cities and stuff. So it pretty much is really um, based on based on the the location as well. So, so Moeen did provide a, a good overview. I, I think uh, what, what's interesting about the company is essentially it's very large. <laughs> There's a lot of subdivisions. And um, I think what was just previewed to everyone is kind of, our, I think, our transmission and distribution uh, kind of organization, which is all the, the wires you see out on, on the grid and all the poles and how we maintain those and how we plan and operate, right? Um, but there's there's also at the broader level, uh, other uh, divisions. So you, you also got kind of our asset strategy and planning division, which uh, really looks into strategizing the the assets and the name, you know, kind of gives it away. Uh, but, uh, and, then, and then you have transmission and distribution, which uh, Moeen uh, explained pretty thoroughly there. And then you have uh, customer service. Uh, so outside of those two kind of groups, then you have customer service in itself, uh, you know, really focusing in, focusing in on what does the customer, uh, you know, what are their expectations? How can we best serve them, right? Not, not to say the other areas don't, but there, there is a focus there. And then we have what's called our operational excellence uh, department. And that looks across the board, uh, across these, these other uh, divisions or organizations and, and really looks at how can we do things better? How can we optimize our processes and, and really uh, provide the, the uh, services that are, that are expected of us as a company? So. Do you have a ballpark figure for how many people work at Southern California Edison? From my experience and latest figures, I, I guess it's it's about fourteen to fifteen thousand uh, individuals. Wow. Do you do you know how many of those might be engineers? I don't know. I'm going to... I wouldn't expect you to have. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I wouldn't expect you to have that number offhand. I was just. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what population of that are engineers. But one thing I wanted to add is. Uh, you know, I, I, I work for other utilities outside of the country and, uh, you know, different countries and different, obviously, culture and everything. And when I when I compare us with other other utilities and others, it's uh, one thing you really caught your eye is we have very strong women and men working together to keep the light on. Right. We have uh, a lot of uh, strong leaders, a lot of strong engineers. And as Everett mentioned, it's really diverse, not only engineering, we have other departments that you see around the clock when you, you know, when everyone goes to sleep, a lot of people are working around the clock um, out of all these 14, 13,000 people. Some of, some good population of these folks are working. So we make sure we have our air, con air conditioning running, our car is getting charged and get ready for the next day, right? So um, certainly there's a very empowerment culture there that, you know, keep keep the uh, this 14,000 people together and, uh, you know, we can keep the light on. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely amazing that you know I can't even remember the last time that I had a blackout in my home. Uh, I mean, it's so rare that you know, when it happens, people tend to get outraged about it because they're just so used to having it. Um, it's it's actually quite amazing if you think about it. Um, so you mentioned earlier, Moeen, that uh, there are many types of engineers who work at a electric utility like Southern California Edison. So, you know, uh, Everett's already talked about electrical engineers and well, he's a computer engineer as well. Uh, what other kind of engineers uh, work there? So we have, um, like, like you said, we have a broader spectrum of engineers in, in SE, um, specifically, in, maybe I can speak about my team and I can expand it to others. Uh, our titles or the titles for engineers, we don't have I mean, so far in our, my AOR, uh, we don't have a title called electrical engineer. It's called engineer. Engineer meaning someone who has an engineering degree, has an interest to do the work. So in my team, I do have mechanical engineers. 
um, you know, that you know they, they perform uh, as an engineer, also I have electrical engineers that they perform as engineers. Uh, in the broader picture, I also have I came across uh, civil engineers. They have their own dedicated you know team that they're looking at a lot of a structure and civil for the substation or for different things that we wanted to set up. Uh, and I believe we do have maybe some other unique skill sets of engineers in, in, in the company. So I guess my message there was uh, uh, we're an electric company, but we also uh, we have a lot of uh, strong leaders, a lot of strong engineers that they're coming from other engineering backgrounds and electrical. And, uh, you know, we, we still, you know, we, we, our entrance requirement would be the electrical, it's our engineering degree, right? So, and then from there, we have a lot of uh, uh, extended uh, sort of training sessions for different folks to bring them up to speed and uh, bring them to the functions that they need to perform. So some of the listeners right now might be, you know, high school students or college students who are thinking about what kind of career uh, they want to go into. And uh, what I'm wondering is right now, you know, at this moment, is there a high demand for engineers in the electric utility uh, field? Yeah, certainly. So good, uh, like I mentioned, a uh, good population of our folks, especially in my team are engineers. So there is a, uh, you know, the a high demand there's a you know fair demand for you know having engineers uh, you know looking at different things doing different analysis. Um, this maybe discussion is, maybe is uh, is more relevant pre-COVID, post-COVID, and things change and everything. Uh, but uh, certainly at this point we have um, a fair uh, you know demand of engineers that you know coming to our teams and performing engineering functions. Yeah, and just to to add to that. Uh... As uh, Moeen mentioned, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of engineers in, in different divisions. Um, we also, uh, on an annual basis, uh, pick up new uh, interns. Uh, uh, that's inclusive of, you know, engineers and a large set of them, uh, but also other majors across the, the company. And we, and we do that on a on an annual basis, uh, we, we kind of uh, begin our recruitment in September to October timeframe. And then um, in spring timeframe, that's when we, we start uh, to bring some of these uh, uh, successful candidates for a summer summer internship. And that'll definitely uh, kind of, uh, def depending on how you perform right <laughs> during the summer, uh, then you, you could uh, be eligible to be extended as a, as a year round intern. And that's, that's kind of how we continue to, uh, you know, uh, bring in new talent, new skill sets, and, and continue to be uh, diverse uh, within the company. Yeah, and if you have any links or anything you'd like me to put in the show notes uh, about summer internships, I, I know my students are always looking for internships during the summer, so uh, <laughs> they would probably be really happy to have that information. Yep, yep, and we could we could add that, uh, but it, it is uh, edisoncollegejobs.com, uh, and uh, you could go on there and create your account and uh, look at all the, the various uh, intern positions that are available. And, and also, if you're already graduated, I, I think uh, there's also some of the um, entry-level positions on, on that site. So what is day-to-day -day work like for you, Everett, at Southern California Edison? You know, if, I, if you took me through an entire week or a month or whatever the relevant time frame is, uh, what is it like for you? Um, what kind of jobs do you do? And, and do you have any examples of maybe projects you've worked on? Yeah, yeah, de definitely. Um, and, and again, so I'm, I'm a senior engineer manager. Uh, a lot of the stuff I, I get to uh, be involved in is not just myself working on them these days. <laughs> it's definitely a team effort. Uh, cross collaborative across uh, various uh, various you know engineers and planners and um, various types of uh, technical folks that that help us uh, develop some of the stuff that that I get to be a part of but <laughs> but essentially um, I'm I'm currently in what's called the technology integration group uh, I lead a, a uh, what's called the, the grid apps portfolio team. And essentially we're, we're tasked with uh, implementing uh, various uh, system planning and grid operation tool sets. Uh, so, so what does that mean, right? So as we're getting, uh, you know, we're, we're modernizing our grid, we're getting, you know, uh, 
more data points from the grid. We're trying to integrate renewable power. Um, a lot of our internal systems require new planning solutions, new ways to, to analyze the grid, new ways to operate the grid. And so my day-to-day -day, uh, at the moment is how do we stand up these new software solutions uh, with, with you know, engineering experts and IT developer experts and then third-party vendors uh, to, to really stand up these new solutions to solve the new um, the new challenges that we have to, to provide more transparency and insight to external uh, uh, parties. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll throw a pitch out there uh, for a marketing opportunity here. Uh, there is a, a website out there known as our DRP external portal. Internally, we reference it as the Dr. Pep. Um, if you put DRP EP on, on Google, uh, essentially you'll get one of our websites where you could actually see the entire grid and its um, reserve capacity or its capacity to integrate new generators. And, and that was a uh, collaboration uh, internally between uh, T&D and IT. Uh, and then uh, externally, our, our, since we're, we are a, a, an investor-owned utility and, and we're governed by the, the state, the California Public, Public Utilities Commission, uh, they did require us to, to build this portal. Uh, but essentially, it was, it was an interesting thing to, to go into now publishing internal data externally for to now create a, a better partnership with our renewable um, third-party uh, partners so yeah if, if folks could get on there take a look uh, that that is one project we we've been working through the years and uh, that's kind of the day-to-day -day is just you know working with uh, uh, engineer experts and uh, it software developers to really create these new innovative solutions uh, for the future and I'll put that link in the uh, in the show notes as well. I'm actually curious to check that out. <laughs> so, Moeen, what is a uh, day to day uh, work like for you at Southern California Edison? So, you know, same as uh, what Everett mentioned, I'm also engine manager for uh, one of the regions of the distribution. Um, However, I can walk you through what our engineers they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And also I can bring an example when I was pretty much doing this role, um, what was, you know, that day-to-day that -day looked like. Also, I need to add that uh, I used to work in the team that Everett used to leave. So he used to be my manager at, a, at, at some certain point. And it's always a, a pleasure to, you know, have the discussion with you guys about around that. So maybe starting with um, what we do and what is that day-to-day -day for our engineer uh, look like so our engineers uh, you know each engineer like i said we have uh, some sort of um, hierarchy that we look at the district so each district each distribution district supports various cities uh, so let's say just for example one district supports seven seven or ten cities and in that seven or ten cities we have a lot of distribution connections or lines where we call it circuits which start from one circuit from one system City and past couple of cities and you know feed a lot of you know customers average maybe uh, one to two thousand customers are in one given circuit. So our engineers are responsible for a lot of uh, customer review. So a customer come to us and say, I wanted to install the motor. Um, if I install this motor, what's going to happen to the system, right? If I wanted to interconnect a generation, right? If I wanted to interconnect that, what does that look like to the system? So we, we we do get involved in a lot of customer requests, and those customer requests go to goes to different teams, um, and then come to us as a field engineer or distribution engineer. We review those and we provide that response. And um, met most of the time, we need to walk the customer through what that response means, right? What they can do, what they can't do, not only to protect them but also to protect other all other customers in the, in the system. Um, we also respond to a lot of grid events if there is any engineering input is needed. Uh, pretty much, we support the operation operation side. We we do have uh, you know engineers um, on duty. Uh, so you know, as I mentioned, you know the time that is out of the you know uh, working hours, we have engineers on the call waiting ready. Or if there any grid event happen, they call them, they get their inputs, they do analysis, and they provide that that sort of operation support. Um, we also support a lot of system planners. So when I say system, system is pretty much. Uh, 
um, the distribution system, right? The bullfish class that is in distribution. So um, each year, SCE plans the system for the next 10 years, right? Right now, which we are in almost end of the summer, we're getting ready for the next summer. So from right now, we start planning for the next one. Uh, it used to be one engineer does the planning and also support all the operation and everything. But recently, we have divided the task. So and since we have divided the task, my team is really focused on operation, uh, but also our team provide a lot of feedback to the people who are plan the system, right? So we make sure all the wires, the cables, everything that we have out there is good for another 10 years. And if we need to pro you know, provide projects or we need to expand our system, um, you know, since you know the expanding the expanding the system, it's it's not a one day or a month or a year thing. It takes a couple of years for us to build something, to get the permit, to get the traffic control, get out there, make the connection, and you know transfer the load so not everyone get get you know affected and everything. So it really takes a long time for us to not a long time, a first time to get to that you know project. So that's why uh, our team pretty much works with the planners to make sure that you know the system you know it's it's if there's any upgrade you identify those upgrades um so pretty much that's what it is in a day to day so you come in you see you know a bunch of you you're you're a middleman in a lot of different things right you're taking the message from one person you do what your analysis you pass it to that person that person give it to the customer they have questions they come back again to you so you need to provide those um those parts so maybe one example of the projects that i have done uh, when i was you know Several years ago, I was in, in, in engineering seat. It was the um, a project that was related to NFL Stadium in Inglewood, right? So the, the goal was to provide enough power for the development around the NFL Stadium, right? So the information came to me. Um, you know, this is this is the area look like. This is you know the capacity, and then when the information comes to you, it will take several iteration to get to the actual what you need, right? Because we need to speak in the same language as far as this is what I need, this is what the numbers look like. And and then once you put those numbers in the system, you identify what upgrades are needed. So I put the information in the tools that Everett's tool, Everett's team is, is building for us or improving for us. We put those information in those tools and those tools pretty much will tell us pretty much what are the things that we need to do. And, you know, we make an RN, a lot of engineering judgment and a lot of engineering calls on those based on the training that we have received in the company and based on the knowledge that we have. So off of that, we started, you know, we introduced a new uh, a new upgrade to the system. So we had to spend a fair money to, you know, from the substation to expand a, a circuit to go all the way, you know, to the Prairie Avenue, that's the avenue which the NFL stadium is, is on there to pretty much expand the system, right? So that project took almost, you know, two or three months to, um, just to develop the scope and almost two years to to put it out there, right? So this is 2017, almost when I'm talking about this project. Uh, so yeah, it was a lot of interaction, understanding the numbers, digesting it, putting in a tool, understanding what the results of the tool. Not all the numbers coming from the tool it means it's right, correct? You need to have your engineering judgment, understand what that's what that means, right? Um, uh, it, not uh, always not the worst case scenario is the highest number. Anyway, so getting understanding those numbers and working with other partners to bring it to the actual level and uh, uh, seeing the project from A, which is planning all the way to the construction. So, so if the power goes out in the next Super Bowl, we know we know who who planned this thing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just for clarity, my project was around the stadium, not the stadium itself. It's from a different. <laughs> No, we, we we have this recorded. We have this recorded, and it will stay up forever. So, um, so it sounds like you do interact a lot with the public in various ways. How important is communication in your job internally? Uh, so things like giving presentations, writing reports, interacting with other engineers. If, if you could discuss a little bit about how important uh, uh, communication is in your job, that would be wonderful. Like you said, communication or how to communicate or understand what is the ask and work towards that is, is, is very key for us, right? Uh, maybe I address the public parts first and I get to the internal. So certainly when you want to talk to the public, you really need to understand what is the concern of the public, right? Uh, how we can address it within the guideline and within the power that we have. And if we need to involve any other entities, right? Um, and uh, understanding the, you know, what channels you need to involve, right? 
uh, and certainly run it that run that by your peers, by your leaders, by others to make sure that you know we're making the best decision at the end. How we wanted to communicate that is 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 is, is critical. So maybe I put myself as an example as an immigrant. So obviously English is not my first language, but uh, I did learn through working for utilities for several years and, and on, on the other side for consultant, uh, you know, how you need to explain something in the simplest way possible for the folks who are not really in engineering field, right? So I do go to a lot of different discussions that you need to uh, simplify the system in the simplest way to describe it to the customer, not only to the customer, but also to the commission, to the uh, to the city halls, to different you know entities that they're asking us a question. So that will be a, a capability that engineers need to build in their mind, how to be able to zoom in and zoom out so everyone can see the entire picture. Uh, how you can speak to something that it's, it's, it's very technical, but you need to say it in the simplest way so everyone can say, yeah, I understand, I understand that. So th that becomes throughout the, throughout the years and experience that you get, right? It's not something that on day one, uh, you expect everyone, you know, hit the, hit the road running and everything like that. Uh, we also have a lot of trainings, uh, not for communication pieces specifically, but a lot of trainings that you need to go up there and present. Um, you need to present to uh, other senior engineers or leaders. Um, and, uh, you know, we will be helping and coaching, right? It's not only for us to um, see someone is, for example, is, is, is a good communicator or not. We also provide enough coaching. We have enough resources through human resources and through our leadership and th through our peers that we provide that, you know, trainings to the engineers and say, you know, this, these are the keywords you need to use. This is how you wanted to pitch it. This is how you wanted to say it. So a lot of coaching goes to that. And that's a day-to-day -day practice for every and any leader in, in SC to make sure to foster a better culture for everyone to communicate better. Uh, so that goes not only for internal, but also goes for external. Um, personally, for me, it was not only doing a lot of presentations, but also, you know, being involved in a lot of, um, a documentations, rate case that we write for, you know, the commission, how much budget we need for the next year. So a lot of these things, it comes handy and ever and I actually participate in a lot of those, those kind of discussions. So um, that's as far as, you know, what we do want wanted to learn as far as, you know, the, the, the communication. Internally also, um, SCE has a very unique culture of the trust, meaning we really, like I, when I come into the to the office, I really see everyone as my family member. Uh, I'm sure same for everyone and others. And we have a very open communication, right? The things that come up from the our leaders at the top all the way will get communicated really clearly to everyone, right? This is what it is. This is the expectation. This is you know something that we need to stay away from and make sure that we, we consider that. And that really goes around the psychological safety that. Um, that open discussions, it really provide a safe environment for everyone to start talking and communicating, right? So if, if you're a person coming from an a, a engineering school or from school to SD to intern, maybe for the first couple of days or weeks, you will shy away from start speaking up. But as you see others are chiming in and there's a lot of team building activities and a lot of different things virtually right now, we do a lot of virtual team, team activities as needed to keep folks engaged. Um, I think you'll have a lot of chance to improve your communications skill um, if you haven't built it already, right? Um, one thing we always, I always will practice in my team and I've seen other, other leaders are practicing is always be there for the employees and help them to have that whatever skill that they need to improve, we be there for them, with them to help them to improve that piece. Yeah, and, and I'd imagine Everett in your job as a senior engineering manager, you have to do a lot of communication with people who are underneath you and, and probably other managers as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and and what, what gets interesting is also kind of uh, when you have these cross collaborative type of projects in a, in a company as large as uh, SoCal Edison, uh, you may be interacting with uh, groups that you've never dealt with before, right? Uh, they may be in a completely different division and, and you know, here we are tr uh, trying to integrate a new solution with them. And, and so, so now you have to kind of learn their side of the, the business, how they come into the broader picture. And uh, I, I will add kind of 
there there is also this interaction when you're when you're dealing like with something like a software solution that that involves multiple groups you not only have to communicate across on the business side but now you also have to talk to to IT and IT has a different language and and, and then kind of going to to Moeen's point about you know simplification and really being concise about what is it that you know this part of the business needs becomes really key that, that you become this interpreter of what the business need is and how do you implement that and, and I don't I, I think you know that IT and and business um, is one example but like Moeen mentioned you, that same example propagates into almost any project where you have you know key experts in one area that are performing something for you know, an external customer, an internal customer, and, and you're just trying to to keep things simple, keep everyone aligned, and and, and really, you know, truck forward towards the the end goal. Uh, it, it is definitely a an ongoing uh, skill set that that people refine over the years, and you know, even at the management and leadership level, that that is key. Um, so yeah. So Everett, earlier, uh, and actually both Moeen and, and you uh, mentioned this, um, we talked about some of the uh, long-term challenges uh, for uh, electric utility, like Southern California Edison, things like incorporating increasing numbers of renewables, like solar into the grid, uh, modernizing the grid. If you could speak a little bit more on what some of the challenges are going forward, let's say in the next 20, 30 years, and uh, also, if there's any other major challenges that, that we haven't covered yet. There are challenges. Um, it's interesting at our company, uh, in my experience, uh, the training we have gotten over the, the recent years is, you know, always kind of keeping this positive aspect to it and, and green framing what we call, right? So I, I don't like- Opportunities. How about opportunities? Yeah, there we go. So- <laughs> So I don't like to see it as challenges, but there's there's various opportunities uh, in in the near term. Um, I mean, we've even seen some of those opportunities in, in past, um, really with uh, a, a lot of the ways that we've we've um, streamlined our processes to to get a renewable power. So, you know, anyone within the SoCal Edison territory, um, I believe our current rate of getting your solar interconnected um, is about a, a five day kind of turnaround time frame, which used to be a lot longer. Um, but, but, you know, having said that, you know, some of the challenges uh, ahead of us is as we begin to adopt more of those kind of um, technologies, right? Uh, there is definitely a, a push to, to meet, you know, uh, state goals, state renewable goals, and that includes um, electric vehicles, battery storage, more photovoltaic, uh, what we also call in, in two white papers that we actually have published, uh, and if folks haven't read it, uh, they're really great reads uh, that, that talk about the challenges and opportunities, is, um, you know, Pathway 2045 and Reimagine the Grid. Uh, and essentially in those where we talk about how, you know, given the state goals and really trying to meet them, um, there, there will be, you know, uh, some, some opportunity here to, to like you, you mentioned, modernize the grid, right? Uh, be able to be ready for when these new uh, technologies come on board and, 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 and have a partnership between grid and third party technologies. And, and having that holistic partnership helps us get to those to meeting those goals. Now, how, how do we best uh, plan for it? How do we best operate? Those, those are the, the kind of thoughts that are out there is how do we do this and how do we do it affordably and, uh, and reliably, right? Um, these, these different dynamics will, will change the way that, that we operate the grid and plan for it. Yeah, and I'm right now just uh, looking up the goals for just renewables in California, and I'm seeing about 60% of the energy supply from renewables by 2030, uh, 
and 100% carbon free by mid century. So that's, that's a pretty big uh, challenge or opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Everett brought up a really good point as far as the pathway 2045. And uh, maybe I double click on that a little bit more. So, you know, the, the, the pathway 2045, which is essentially it, it brings the opportunity for California to be the first state in the United States that have a 100%, will have 100%, you know, energy from renewable, you know, renewable resources, you know, bring that to the table, uh, but also um, provides that opportunity for SCE as one of the, you know, one of the uh, largest utility to provide, to be able and set up the network or the system ready for that kind of interconnection, right? As the 2045 pathway goes along, that provides a, a wide range of customer choices. So we used to, we didn't have, used to not have the electric vehicle, right? It used to be only car, only solar, started with solar, the journey started with solar. And then after that, you know, uh, vendors are starting, you know, bringing batteries. So it was now is a combo of solar and battery in the house. And then electric vehicle came around. Now you have your solar, you have your battery and you have your electric vehicles. Um, and then, you know, the thing is, is, is getting more and more complex as we move forward, right? At the end of the day, there is one grid that connects all these things together. Imagine like internet that connects all these computers together. That you that's pretty much that will be us to make sure that the system is set up and ready to be able to interconnect the system. So as far as opportunity, maybe I can say in traditional power system, it used to be a flow coming from substation or from the, where the power gets generated coming to the customer. Now it's not only that, but also now customer is generating power and pushing back to the system. So now we have the second tool coming, right? So, uh, you know, not to make it too technical, but not everything in the system is ready for this kind of double flow in, this, in, 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 the, in the grid. And that includes the, the, the cables, the switches and everything else that we have in there. So um, SE is, is taking a, a, um, a, a different steps to get there, not only to bring the right hardwares in, in the field, but also uh, whatever its team is working on is to develop very unique softwares that some of those softwares, uh, based on my experience, I can say those are really unique, not only to the United States, but also to the world, what, what we're pretty much providing and what we're doing. So that pretty much goes along with you know, how we became a technology utility, right? Not only looking at the 10 years planning, but also going beyond and see what really is needed for 2045. Um, and, and it's not only that, it's not only SC as a utility, right? Is is also, we have a vendor community who provides these equipments. And we also have a commission who is oversee all the utilities, right? So it's a triangle of utility, uh, you know, um, the vendor community, and also the commission or the state, they all work together to address these, you know, these uh, opportunities or use this opportunity towards the better future. So uh, I'm, I'm really sure, at, at least in our side, based on our experience, SC is really doing what we can do. Um, and uh, it's a really exciting future. You, you know, I, I really would like to fast forward 2045 to see how exciting the future will be. But I guess uh, we're going to be patiently waiting for that and see how, how that goes. And uh, uh, yet, like I said, it's going to be very interesting. To, to, to give also broader perspective on this, um, if you were to think about kind of the utility as a machine or the, the electric grid as a machine, this is one of the largest machines known to man that, that has been created over 130 plus years. And so, so now we're, we're trying to embark on another you know, couple of decades, and and how do you how do you evolve this machine and make sure it doesn't fall apart, right? It's a very essential to our very you know day to day lives. So it's uh, it, it's definitely an opportunity, um, and you know, there's a, there's a lot there, right? You're you're taking your your 130 year old senior into the future. <laughs> how do we how do we do that? Right? Yeah, and I'll, I'll include a, a link to the uh, the Pathway um, 2045 website, uh, Edison's website, uh, in the show notes as well, in case anyone out there listening is interested in learning more about that. So uh, 
I have two questions now from from some students. Uh, and when I let them know that I'll be having this interview today, uh, there was a couple of things that they wanted to know, the ones that I talked to. One is, how important is it to get an advanced degree, like a master's or a PhD in your field? And is getting a, uh, a PE uh, important in your field? An advanced degree, uh, from my experience, uh, I, I, again, got a computer and electrical engineering degree uh, in my bachelor's. And really, uh, during, during that transgression, a lot of the things uh, going on at the time uh, were, were, were really looking at R&D space. R&D was, I, I don't know if it's still the thing <laughs> in, in the college world, but uh, R&D was the place to be. You wanted to be on the cusp of things. And, and so I was really into uh, chip design and you know, working with companies uh, like, or, uh, or pursuing to be in companies like Intel or you know, all, all those types of companies. But once, once I kind of landed on, uh, I actually got an internship with uh, SoCal Edison and started getting more insight on the utility side and start pursuing a career there. That that's where my advanced degree really helped me out. I, I do have a master's in power uh, uh, from the University of Southern California, and that that really honed in on power systems and being able to understand the utility and, and how the grid is is all connected. Aside from kind of the foundational power systems course that you take, right? I think it's like a 300 level course at, at Cal Poly, um, which I, I'm also alumni at Cal Poly Pomona. But, uh, but essentially I was able to advance that, understand more about power systems, power system protection, the sub-transmission, transmission systems, you know, all of the, the advanced power system courses. And with that, I also have my professional engineer's uh, license in power and so that that definitely helped me de- deep dive even more into kind of the overall core business of of SoCal Edison and really understanding how you know motors transformers how electromagnetics is all intertwined into that cuz when you get into a company uh, you may have a specific position but you don't really get to investigate all the various subjects that are involved with with the grid in this case. Uh, so, so yeah, definitely the PE and the, the master's degree allowed for, for that. Do you have a lot of engineers who work for you know, Southern California Edison who don't have PEs and don't have advanced degrees? I'll provide my position and <laughs> I'll let Moeen also uh, chime in. Um, I would say, um, it's uh, so I've been with the company now 13 going on 14 years, but, but <laughs> uh, essentially I think it's been cyclical uh, in terms of like how many folks get their PEs and you know how many you know other other incoming classes or incoming uh, engineers uh, whether or not they get their PE. Um, I, I think it all depends. Uh, in past, it used to be a requirement within within the company to to get to other levels of, of the positions. Um, uh, as of late, that that is not a requirement, uh, but it, it definitely helps kind of uh, you know build out your resume and you know really show that you you have that expertise. Uh, I do know though in other uh, utility spaces like municipalities or or other utility companies it's sometimes seen as a requirement. So uh, it's always good, good to have. And, and in addition, you know, it, it also, the, at least the PE license um, allows you to, to have a, another route in, in this industry. Say you want to, you want to do consulting later. Um, maybe, you know, you got enough experience in, in a utility and you want to take that experience somewhere else. Uh, you have that under your belt. It gives you more opportunities uh, within the industry. Yeah. So, Moeen, uh, based on your experience at Southern California Edison and at other uh, electric utilities, uh, how important do you see getting advanced degrees and getting a PE license? Maybe I, I answer that on my personal perspective before I get to and speak about experience on, on, on the utility in the utilities. I think 
uh, for me, if I like a food, I like to have it every day, right? Uh, I, I really, I don't think there is any limit that you want to stop your education. And uh, I don't really look at it. What is the requirement for me to get to a role? I really want to know in the, my role, how can I be uh, the most informed as much as I can, right? So that could be throughout taking convocational courses or going to school or however that you would like to get to that IT level. Certainly for, you know, entering the company, you would need, an, and not every part, but engineering side, you need an engineering degree from a credit university. So that's, that's a step one. And then once you get in, you know, once you get into that, um, the, the field is, it's so dynamic that we're seeing a lot of new technology. Then the more equipped you get, it's a, it will be a lot easier and you're going to have a lot more options uh, to not only perform your job, but also to seek a next step, right? I always have seen that uh, the discussion around, um, you know, how a, another degree will add another perspective. Look at it this way: that if you add one lens or double lens to how you see the world, right? So it, it's certainly going to make make the picture a lot more clear for you. Now, when you're adding the PDP to it, uh, certainly when you seek the professional, you know, engineering license, that opens the door for you to not only understand how the electrical engineering really plays out in the field, but also introduce you to code and how the, you know, California is dealing with that or this perspective. So putting all these things pers to perspective, when you go and talk to the contractors, which they are mostly, or I would say 100%, they're all PE licensed, right? You want to speak to the same language. So it, it will be certainly critical to have that when you wanted to have that discussion. Not to say if you don't have it, you can't perform your job. I'm just saying like, having these things is going to open more and more options for you. And especially when you're young and you have the time and you have the opportunity and your things are fresh, my personal recommendation would be to anyone who want to ask me this question is do as much as possible before you get to the life, right? When you get to the life and you start, you know, expanding the family and everything, I'm sure whatever is case, you know, having a, a kid is going to get really, really tough to, you know, go back to school and do these things. So might as well, while you're at it, you know, continue. Certainly in, in SCE, we have a lot of programs that support getting your, you know, your master degree or even higher than that. So that's already in play, right? Uh, it's just a matter of how you can manage your time and uh, take advantage of the time that now you have the energy and, uh, you know, the, the patience to, to kind of go to the school and do those things. The, the second question that students wanted to know is in your day to day activities, how much math do you actually need and use? Like, so when you were going through, you know, getting your degrees, I mean, there's a lot of things related to calculus and trig and all these different, all these different, uh, you know, higher level, probably lots of complex numbers in electrical uh, engineering. Uh, how much math do you actually use on your, in a day-to-day -day life or day-to-day -day work? One thing that, uh, you certainly you and when you go to school, you 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 learn differential equation and a lot of different things, right? Which not hundred percent all of the things that we see there will be applicable to the job that I do today, right? Um, however, application of those will really come to the play when you work with advanced tool. Uh, like I said, every tool develops a lot of advanced tools. So, if a given software give you an answer, maybe I start talking about one specific topic is a short circuit theory, which is Pretty much, you know, is a it's a severity of overcurrent if a fault occurs in the system. Uh, in a school, when you go, they, they tell you this is how you have to do it, right? Um, interesting enough, we do we teach the same in our training. So we tell this, we tell our new engineers, this is how you need to do it by hand in case your tool is not working. In case your tools gives you an answer, the tools is spit an answer. But what does that answer means to you? Uh, even if you have the answer, how you want to use the answer in, in order for you to understand how you use that answer and give that number to the customer, you need to really understand what the number is coming from. So you need to kind of sample backpedal and understand how this number is being built. And if you get a high number, you would know what's, well, what went wrong, you know. So uh, not to say you, wouldn't, you need to bring all your books to the, to the office, but you really need to understand a, a summarized way of kind of, okay, if I get this, what does the number look like? So to, to some extent, to, to a lot of different, you know, you know, a lot of different occasions um, in my day today, I used to use a lot of different calculators that I built. 
on Excel with the same formula that I got from school. And I always compare my results with the, what you know, tools is giving me. Also being uh, a field engineer, distribution engineer uh, in, in pretty much in where, where Moline's uh, division or AOR is at today. Um, in early on in my career, uh, I was also in that role. And um, what was interesting at times and, and going back to kind of understanding that the grid is a 130 plus year behemoth of a thing. <laughs> um, there's a lot of math that went into that. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of brilliant minds that put things together. And so as a, as a new entry level engineer and, and looking at some, some of the older parts of the grid, uh, you got to revisit that math. You got to re-engineer and re-understand how, you know, these past engineers put these things together and why does it work the way it works, right? And, and you know, at times, you know, the paper trail, <laughs> it's been 100 years. <laughs> that paper trail may not be as, uh, as uh, you know, well put together. And, and so you, you got to revisit that. You got to, re- and I, I would say in personal experience, I remember, us pulling, you know, some some literature out to really re understand how that math was put together to to make the solution work, uh, and then this is both, you know, uh, some software that that has been built over the years, and then also in, in the hardware space, and, and when I mean hardware space, like actual field automation that it, that is put out there, uh, and really understanding how how the you know the settings were put together or how the actual apparatus equipment is working in tandem together because it's very interesting when you get out there and you see wow like how did they put this thing together why is that transformer there and why is it wired this way um there there's a lot of math there and i would say um yeah there there are some some uh subjects that maybe you don't revisit a, a whole ton but it comes in handy when uh, you have these these special cases. So uh, you've been very generous uh, with your time, Everett and Moeen. But I have, I have one last question to ask you, and it's it's uh, a question I usually will ask uh, people who are current engineers. If there's a high school student or college student right now listening to this episode, they got really excited about working for uh, an electric utility company like. Southern California Edison, how can they better prepare themselves uh, right now in high school uh, or college? Um, and, you know, would taking certain uh, engineering courses or non-engineering courses help them to prepare? And once they've done that preparation, how can they actually, you know, get a foothold in that field? I would say reach out to as many educational avenues that are, that are open to you. Uh, that's, that's even, you know, the community college that may have various classes, uh, you know, that, that don't require, you know, um, a prereqs and things like that entry level courses, right. That just, just get involved, get, get, get out there, uh, look at the, the course catalog and some of these places, it, you know, if, if you know somebody, uh, maybe pull them aside, get, get a, a quick interview with them and really get a, a download of what's what's available. Um, I, I would say within Southern California Edison, there's there's various uh, uh, there's there's some scholarships at the high school level that the the company is involved with. Um, there's various uh, volunteer events that the the company is doing, and you, you could reach out and and, and um, get involved with folks there. Uh, we, we also, as a, with, with in partnership with HR, go out to various high schools, colleges, and you know, you know, get the email, get the the uh, business card. Uh, don't be afraid to to talk to people if you're really interested in, in a path uh, this uh, in in this career in this industry. Um, and and there's various outlets. It's not only SoCal Edison, right? Yeah. Moeen mentioned that there's vendors involved. There's uh, government uh, entities involved in this industry. Uh, 
that there's now you know all these renewable companies that are involved in this in industry and so if the if you know one path closes there's definitely other paths and you can make your way into the, the utility and, and one one other uh, quick point um sometimes it's it's not only engineering and i know we're talking about engineering uh, but there's other avenues within uh the utility that that is uh, somewhat engineering uh, but it's it's uh uh, there are other uh, avenues, um, like say, for instance, uh, we have a, what's called a planning organization that actually creates the designs of the the poles and the grid, or not the grid, but like the wires and the poles and how that, you know, structurally comes together. There, there's those other kind of uh, careers there. And I know, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but I know um, Cal Poly Extension, is it? The extended university yeah i think it's called the college of extended university yeah 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 uh, they also provide a uh, a certification class where we also recruit uh i mean it's a non-engineering position but it's uh the, they recruit for what's called a, a planner uh, within the utility and moeen do you have any advice for any students who might be listening to to have a better opportunity for working at an electric utility? Sure. So maybe I start from my own, I talk about my own story that how I pre pre prepared myself. So first thing first is, uh, I think for the first part of it, you know, preparation is uh, realistically kind of understand what is the day-to-day, -day, you know, on the utility look like. There are a lot of, like Everett mentioned, a lot of different resources out there to kind of understand those and see if that's something it, it kind of catch your interest. Second one is, uh, you know, if there, you're in a different engineering school you're going to, and maybe I'm really targeting the engineering uh, engineers who are interested to be part of this, you know, or any any electric utility, is you know there are a lot of uh, topics will be discussed as far as power system, right? Uh, the power system, those are really powerful uh, topics that yet to this date on see myself sometimes go back to it and you know review it and just because of the interest because of the refresh my you know my uh, my memory on those and any circuit you know circuit one circuit two, whatever topics or subject they, they offer in the school those are always really good to uh, be really really understanding those topics and not walking away out of the class without understanding it right um, so and and th those are pretty much the two two uh, couple in a couple subjects comes to my mind the other part of that if you really wanted to understand what is the, you know, the how you want to kind of get into this um, field is, if I mean, if you're a Cal Poly Pomona student, we're across the street, right? I mean, right, not right now is because of the pandemic, not so many people working from the office, uh, but, you know, I'm sure we will figure a way around it, you know, and as we all say, if we're going back to the office, I think will be another time for everyone if, if they wanted to visit or if they want uh, you know, based on whatever safety protocol we have at a time, we can revisit that discussion and have that sort of uh, communication. Open houses, like Everett mentioned, we have open houses. Um, and there are a lot of information online. Even if you go to SCE.com, there's a lot of one pagers has been written uh, and kind of described the business. Uh, so, you know, I, I really recommend to look at those. Last but not least, all the information that you want is online, right? Um, so it's just a matter of you putting dedicating a time, even, even 15 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, you kind of look browse through those. IEEE has a lot of paper that comes from a lot of utility experts or from you know academia experts. So um, I would really go through those papers and start maybe reading a half a, a part of those. Um, I remember I used to. Uh, download the IEEE papers and only read the abstract and the summary to kind of understand if this is really I'm interested. And if I am, then I'm going to start clicking on those and going after the reference and everything. So there are a lot of different avenues, uh, not to make it so nerdy discussion, but there's a lot of different avenues that you can kind of follow and uh, see if that's really truly what you like, because you're going to be doing it when you get to it. You really wanted to do it in a level that you can get good amount of, good amount of experience. So it's going to be a day to day practice. Well, Moeen and Everett, thanks so much for sharing your experiences. And I know for me personally, it was really interesting to to learn about some of the uh, the challenges or opportunities, as uh, <laughs> as you like to think of them, uh, in your field. And um, 
yeah, there's a lot of great advice out there for anyone who's interested in this field. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Well, thanks again to Everett Moeen for sharing their experiences about what it's like to work at an electric utility. They wanted me to add a quick disclaimer that their experiences and opinions do not necessarily represent SoCal Edison. We didn't talk about anything controversial, but it's common for employees of large organizations like SoCal Edison to add a disclaimer like this when doing interviews. Well, before I sign off, I would like to mention that if you're enjoying this podcast, there are a few ways that you can support it. You can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Spotify, and many others. You can rate the podcast and leave comments on whatever app that you use to listen to the podcast. And finally, you can help spread the word about the podcast by telling your friends and family or anyone else that you think might be interested in this podcast. If you have any comments about this episode, feel free to email me at tesepodcast at gmail.com and I will place the email address in the show notes. I'll personally read each email and try my best to respond to them all. Well, take care, everyone, and goodbye for now.